Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of Astro at Home. This improvised astronomy program we started since uh, schools are now closed due to the pandemic. So thanks for joining us again. We still have many families joining us day after day at 2 p.m. Eastern. I know many more are watching the recording. So thank you if you're there, even if it's not live. Um, my name is Julie. I run the program Discover the Universe, and I'm very excited to have our guest speaker today to present to you, um, my friend Mary Beth Lechak, who's, um, hold on, I need to get her. Mary Beth, I seem to be having a hard time getting your video on, so if you want to do it quickly. I think I got it, Julie. Perfect. Hi, Mary Beth. Hey, Julie. <laughs> Mary Beth is joining us live from Hawaii. She works at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. So for her, actually, it's very early. It's like 8 a.m. instead of being 2 p.m. for me. Um, so thanks, Mary Beth, for joining us. Um, we've been Mary Beth and I have been collaborating on different projects for years. So I'm very excited to have her present to you about the planets. So hold on, just one last thing before I let Mary Beth start. If you have questions, it happens in the chat on YouTube. Please try to keep the conversation um, related to the, today's presentation, uh, the conversation related to today's presentation. Yeah, I think I said it right. I wasn't sure. Uh, but please remain polite. That's the main thing for to everyone. And we will try to, uh, I will be texting questions for Mary Beth, but I tell you right away, she probably won't have time to answer all of them. So you don't, you don't need to post your questions 50 times. I'll, I'll send them to Mary Beth and she'll do her best. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks Mary Beth for being there. All right. Thank you, Julie, so much for hosting today. I know this is your second session of the day. So like Julie mentioned, it is 8 a.m. here in Hawaii. I live on the big island of Hawaii, um, which is in the United States, for those of you who are tuning in from around the world. And um, my presentation today, let me just get everything set up, is um, called Meet the Planets. And so as Julie mentioned, my name is Mary Beth Lechak. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications at the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope. So before we really do a deep dive into the planets, I'm going to start by explaining a little bit more about my telescope. So let's go to the next one. Um, this is an actual picture. This was taken by one of our former astronomers, Jean-Charles Couillon. And this image is CFHT at sunset. We're a 40-year-old telescope. We actually celebrated our 40th birthday at the end of 2019. And over the course of time, we've made adjustments to how we observe in the work that we do based on the different changes and conditions in the world. So um, we're a four meter class telescope. Uh, on Mauna Kea, which is the best site in the world for astronomy. So 3.6 meters for anybody tuning in in the United States, it's about 12 feet. And so a mirror collects light. The most important part of what a telescope does is not what light it collects, but where that light goes. And so we have five cameras that allow us to do different things and collect light in different ways. That is not the point of today's talk, but it does set up some things that I wanna tell you um, about the planets when we get there. So we are funded in part by the National Research Council of Canada. So thank you Canadians watching. You are fund a portion of my salary. Similarly, the French National Science Foundation and the University of Hawaii. I don't know why this slide says our headquarters are located in Waimea twice, but you can see the map here of Hawaii Island. Now, as of tonight, at, or I guess tomorrow morning at 12.01 a.m., we're going to be in a shelter in place on the Big Island. The entire state has been put under shelter in place orders. So I will be talking and doing some remote talks for quite a while now. So one of the things is the size of our telescope doesn't really allow us to look too much at our solar system. The planets are big and they're bright. And so you can look, anything that you can see with your naked eye is something that's really tricky for a big telescope to look at, look for, to look at. So a lot of the images that I'm going to show you are from a textbook or NASA, not images that we've taken at CFHD. And if we're going to talk about the solar system, we have to start by taking a look at all of it. So there are eight planets in the solar system. Um, and we have um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Now, you'll notice Pluto's not on this list. Don't worry if you're a Pluto fan, don't turn the screen off now. We will talk about Pluto in a minute. But any talk that I give about the solar system, I like to start with the most important thing in our solar system, which is the sun. Now, normally when I do presentations about the solar system, 
I have all of my stuffed planets with me. And I actually do one of the demonstrations that Julie will link to in the um, web on her website. And so that's a, a scale model of the solar system. So what I like to do is map out the entire solar system. This is something that you can do in your house in your apartment. Now, if you're in an apartment building, you may have to go out in the hallway and go down the steps. Things are actually super far apart in the solar system. You can also make uh, do the same activity on toilet paper squares. So if we were going to be doing this activity, I would put the sun in the center. This is my sun. Now the sun is not a planet. The sun is a star. And the difference between a star and a planet is stars make their own energy, make their own light. And because of that, they shine very brightly. The temperature in the center of the sun is about a million degrees and a very complex process called fusion occurs there where hydrogen turns into helium and produces energy. Now that is not the talk that I'm giving today. Maybe another day we can talk about making, uh, we can talk about fusion, but today we're just focused on the basics of our solar system. All right, so the first question that Julie has texted that is a great one for me to ask Thank you. Um, what does CFHT stand for? My mistake, I should have mentioned that. The Canada France Hawaii Telescope. So since we're funded by Canada, France and Hawaii, all three partners have their say in our name. So Canada, France, Hawaii Telescope. And how is it so easy to see stars, planets, galaxies from Hawaii? The thing about it is the mountain, Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is a mountain that's 4,200 meters tall or 14,000 feet. And so when you're that high above the surface of the earth, you actually have only about 60% of the air that you would have at sea level, which means that there's a lot less twinkle to the stars. There's also less water vapor and there's more ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet light is the light that um, gives you sunburn. The earth's atmosphere absorbs that ultraviolet light. If you're at the summit though, and you're at 4,200 meters, there's more ultraviolet light. Bad for your skin, but excellent for observing. Now the last question, can the planets move? We're gonna hold off on that question until I get to all of the planets. And I'll answer that one pretty quickly. All right, so the sun, the center of our solar system. The sun has the most gravity, it's the largest object. If you were to take um, all of the mass of the solar system, 99.9% .9 of it is in the sun. And because of that, the sun has such an immense gravity that all of the planets orbit around it. So the planets do move. The earth right now is actually spinning and that's what makes daytime and nighttime. But we're spinning on the earth so we don't feel its motion. All right, so our first planet, this is normally when I give talks. Oh, sorry. I had another star picture. Picture. So in the background, I want you to notice the what kind of looks like um, maybe like caramel corn. That's actually a picture of the surface of the sun. And that picture is a brand new picture taken by our friends at the Daniel K. Anoy Solar Telescope on Maui. That's the next island over. It's the new telescope. It's a new telescope that only looks at the sun. It's a very special kind of telescope called a solar telescope. And what you're seeing in the other photo there is um, a picture of the sun. Now, a full picture of the sun versus the, quote, surface. Now, the sun isn't solid. There's nowhere on the sun that you could actually stand. It instead is sort of like boiling, roiling, rippling water. If you've ever watched water boil, you see how it bubbles and comes to the top. That's what the gas or the plasma in the sun does. And so this background picture is actually what we're seeing, those pockets of what's called convection going up and down. The sun does have infrared light and it gives a tremendous amount of light all across the spectrum. So it has radio waves, it has gamma rays, it has x-rays, it has infrared light. And when you go outside and feel warmth due to the sun, that's the infrared light of the sun there. All right. Could we survive with no sun? No. No, we can't. And the sun is 93 million miles away. Now that's unimportant because the 93 million mile part, because astronomers cheat. So instead of remembering everything in miles, the Earth's fairly close to the sun, as you'll see, and it's 93 million miles away. But for astronomers, we refer to that as one. One astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the Earth. 
So everything else that we talk about in the solar system is gonna be in terms of astronomical units. We can also call that eight light minutes. So the speed of light travels at a very finite speed. It's the speed limit for the entire universe. If we were to turn the sun off like that, eight minutes later, it would get dark on the earth. Now, why that would be bad for us living on the earth is something that we'll talk about when we get to the earth. All right, our next planet, or I guess our first planet, normally I ask if anybody knows what planet we're talking about. So I'm just gonna all assume that you've thought about Mercury. So here's my stuffed Mercury. Mercury right now, since we're all practicing social distancing, is living with one of our engineers. And so Mercury is on its way down from the summit. I want you to notice that there's snow. It does in fact snow in Hawaii. And so Mercury's just chilling out there and relaxing on the dashboard. I will say the person who took this photo was in the passenger seat. So there are definitely no safety concerns there. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about Mercury. Now, when you look at a picture of Mercury side by side with the moon, they look almost exactly the same. And the reason for that is that Mercury has no air. It has no atmosphere like we have on the Earth. Now, you'll notice in the slide behind it, so there's two pictures on this. Um, for every planet, I have all of the critical information that students usually ask me about that planet. How far is it from the sun? You notice that we're in um, astronomical units. If you want to do some math later, you can jot these numbers down and just multiply them by 93 million miles. Um, you also notice that its orbital period is a year. So that's how long it takes to orbit around the sun once. And its rotation period is how long it takes to spin. So that's day and night. So for example, the average orbital period for the Earth is 365.25 days or one year. You'll notice that at 87 days, Mercury has a much shorter year, but the rotation period on the Earth is 24 hours. The rotation period on Mercury is 58 days. So Mercury spins really, 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 really slowly. Now going back to the fact that Mercury has no air, the side of Mercury facing the sun, and here's my stuffed sun, and we're going to use my, my, my teacup as Mercury because it's gray. The side of Mercury facing the sun is going to be super, super warm, very hot. And that's where we're going to see this average surface temperature of 350 degrees Celsius or 662 degrees Fahrenheit. But because there's no air, the back side of the mug the nighttime side is minus 170 Celsius. Now, if you're wondering at the bottom there, wait, that didn't translate into Fahrenheit. You know what? It's still super cold. If you see minus 170 Celsius, that's cold. It doesn't matter what that is in Fahrenheit, super cold. Now, Mercury doesn't have any air, like I mentioned. So you would definitely have to have a spacesuit. And despite how hot Mercury is in some areas, at the North and the South Pole, the craters are so deep and the sun doesn't shine on them that there's actually ice. And so there are parts of Mercury that's super cold and parts of Mercury that are super hot. It's a weird planet. And like I said, it looks a lot like the moon. So I'm gonna take one breath and see if anybody is texting Julie any um, questions about Mercury before I move on. While I'm doing that, I'm gonna answer the question. 10,000 years ago, were there any planets that are not here now? And the answer is no. So all of, the, um, all of the planets that we have in our solar system have been around since the beginning of our solar system, probably about four and a half billion years ago. Now, the way the planets form is an entirely different talk that maybe I'll give another time for you. But... Um, all of the planets in the least 10,000 years, 100,000 years, a million years, a billion years have been very, very stable. So why does Mercury have little lines and dots on the planets? Those lines and dots are actually craters. So the dots would be the craters, whereas something, an asteroid, a rock in space impacted the planet. Now, during the period when the solar system was forming, we went through what was called the heavy bombardment, which meant that all kinds of stuff, all kinds of rock from space hit all of the planets. Now, because we have air and water and wind on the earth, all of our craters are smoothed out. Every crater, every crack that has ever occurred on Mercury is still on the surface of Mercury. It 
does not snow on Mercury and Mercury has no moons. There's an area of Mercury that I want you guys to Google later. It's called the weird terrain. At some point when Mercury was being formed, it was impacted so hard that the shock waves went through the entire planet and formed this really weird area on the backside of the planet that's directly opposite from a giant crater. Right, so our next planet, oops, is Venus. Venus is social distancing with some ladies in our front office. Only one is in the office at a time. So Venus is there to help them with the day-to-day -day activities. Now, Venus is not a girl. Planets don't have gender. But Venus was named after the goddess of love and beauty. Now, I'm giving you guys a homework assignment. I know you thought that you were away from homework right now. But I want you to go outside tonight or the next clear night and look to the west. Venus is going to be the brightest object that you see in the sky. And when you see Venus in the sky, you'll understand why it was named after the goddess of love and beauty. Now, Venus, despite its beautiful sparkling on the earth, is actually a pretty terrible place to live. So if you look down at surface temperature, you'll notice that the average surface temperature on Venus is 860 degrees Fahrenheit or 460 degrees Celsius. Venus has a really heavy, really, really, really thick atmosphere. Now that really, really thick atmosphere, I want you to think of an atmosphere or air like a blanket. If you've ever had a night where you start off the night super chilly and you put on all of your blankets and you wake up in the middle of the night and you're so hot and you just want to throw them off, that's what atmosphere or air does. It traps the heat from the sun and keeps the planet warm. Now, Venus has what we call a runaway greenhouse effect. This was likely caused by lots and lots of volcanoes erupting on Venus when it was uh, a younger planet, when the whole solar system was younger. That put a lot of carbon dioxide into the air. So being on Venus would be like putting your hand in a pizza oven, having it run over by a school bus and having it rain acid on it. So that very thick atmosphere has an incredible pressure that pushes down on the planet. And it um, also has sulfuric acid, which is the uh, acid that would come down in the rain. Now, Venus, um, we can't really see the surface of Venus. The clouds in the atmosphere are so thick. And that's one of the reasons why it shines so brightly. So a question that someone asked earlier was, is there any planet that gives off light? And the answer is yes. Planets don't make light, but planets shine and reflect light backwards. There's a big astronomy term for this. It's called albedo or shininess. And the albedo of a planet really changes based on the composition of the planet. So Venus with its super thick atmosphere um, actually reflects a lot of the light back from the sun. Now, the other thing that I always love about Venus is almost every feature on Venus is named after a woman. All right, so I'm gonna take a pause. Does Venus have sandstorms? So Venus does not likely have sandstorms. When we think of sandstorms, we're thinking more of Mars, which I'll talk to in a minute. Venus has very, very high winds, and we actually can't see all the way down to the surface. We have to use radio telescopes or something called radar to be able to penetrate the clouds of Venus. The volcanoes on Venus are probably not active. And I say that with a question mark because we've only really been able to look at the solar system, study the other planets since the invention of the telescope about 400 years ago. Now, if a volcano hasn't on Earth hasn't erupted in the past 400 years, it's still known as an active volcano or maybe a dormant volcano. Mauna Kea, the volcano that the telescopes are um, in Hawaii live on and were built on, and I can see out my window, Mauna Kea is considered a dormant volcano. It hasn't erupted in the past 10,000 years or so. Could we build a city above the clouds on Venus? I'm going to say probably not. And the reason for that is gravity. Gravity pulls everything downward. Plus, the rain on Venus is made out of sulfuric acid, which eats into metals pretty quickly. I'm not saying no ever. I'm saying we couldn't do it with today's technology. There is no moons for Venus. Venus is a rock planet. When we talk about the gas planets, you'll know. I'll make a real big deal about it. Don't worry. And it has zero moons. 
So any planet that has a surface that we could stand on, and while we would die while trying to stand on Venus, any planet that has a surface is what we call the terrestrial planets, which is a great segue into the Earth and the Moon. So these are some pictures of the Earth and the Moon hanging out in our office. Now, one of the things that makes the Earth special, the most special thing about the Earth is the fact that it has liquid water. So not frozen water and not gaseous water. On Venus, there's probably water in the clouds, but it's in a gas form. Anywhere on the Earth that we find water, we find life. And so that's the key, the fundamental thing that makes the Earth the most special planet that we know of right now is the fact that it has liquid water. Now, the moon is the Earth's companion. It likely formed from the Earth itself. I mentioned earlier that during the early days of the solar system, all those billions of years ago, that the Earth, the, all of the planets were constantly being bombarded and having things crashed into them. So when the Earth was forming, something the size of Mars likely collided with it. That broke the Earth into some pieces, and some of those pieces formed the moon. Now, how the moon formed from those pieces is a much longer talk, and I should be making notes for Julie of all of the other talks that I can give based on this one. Um, the moon controls the tides on the Earth. When we think about gravity, we often think about gravity in one direction. So the gravity, gravitational influence of the sun on the earth or the gravity of the earth on us. You know, we're not flying into space because the earth's gravity pulls us down. Now there is gravity in space. That's actually a big misnomer. It is, there is gravity in space. Wherever there's mass, there's weight, there's gravity. So my teacup has gravity, but because the moon, I mean, the earth is a lot bigger than me or my teacup, that's why the gravity, um, the teacup doesn't fly towards me. Now, when it comes to the difference between the moon and the earth, the parts of the earth that are easiest to move back and forth, the water is in fact because of gravity. So the gravity of the moon pools on the earth and that's what causes the water to move back and forth and make the tides. Now, here's all of our fun earth data and Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are rocky planets or terrestrial planets, and they all have more or less the structure that we see here. There's a crust that we stand on, there's a mantle, an iron core, and a liquid core. I like to think of these planets like a peach. You've got a really thin crust, and then you've got a juicy mantle. That's where all of um, our, our lava comes from. And then in the center, you've got a core that's hard and rocky. And if you were to crack the earth, uh, a peach pit open, you actually see there's a smaller core inside. All right, so our next planet is Mars. Now, Mars is known as the red planet. It's actually pretty tiny. And in this picture, Mars is helping one of our astronomers get ready for a class that she teaches. So Mars is the only planet that's entirely inhabited by robots. Now, people have sent all of those robots to Mars. That's how they all got there. And they do the job of exploring Mars for us. Now, before anybody asks, I know that one of the questions everybody always has is, will we go to Mars? And the answer is, I think so. We will definitely, I don't know if we'll go in my lifetime. Um, definitely hope that we go in yours. All of the, all of the cakey, it's the Hawaiian words for kids. All of the kids in the audience, I think that in our lifetime, your lifetime, people will go to Mars. Now, you'll notice that Mars um, actually has a lot of water, but it's all frozen. And this is one of the reasons why we're studying Mars so intently, is to figure out at what point the water on Mars froze. So underneath the surface of Mars is frozen water. Also, at the top, the North Pole and the South Pole of Mars is frozen carbon dioxide, known as dry ice. Now, as the temperature changes on Mars, as it orbits, you notice that it takes about one 0.88 years to orbit, during the, the summer at the North Pole of Mars, all of that, some of that carbon dioxide turns back into a gas. So the ice at the top shrinks, and then in the winter, that gas that froze, that carbon dioxide freezes, and the ice gets bigger. Now, Mars is going to be really in the news this next year. If you're not already following the Curiosity rover on social media, Totally recommend doing that. Um, also, Mars 2020, which has just been renamed Perseverance, is going to be launching this year to land on Mars in the future. 
Now, as we leave Mars, we're flying through the asteroid belt. Oftentimes students think that the asteroid belt is like what we would see in Star Wars, where we'd be rocking back and forth like that. Not the case at all. The asteroids in the asteroid belt are actually pretty far apart. And that would lead us to our next planet, Jupiter. Here, Jupiter is helping one of our engineers assemble a circuit board. Now, earlier I mentioned that if 90, if we had looked at the solar system in terms of percentages, 99.9% .9 of the mass of the solar system is in the sun. After that, 99% of the mass is in the planet Jupiter. Jupiter is a very large planet. Now, Jupiter is the first planet that we're getting to that it doesn't have a solid surface. There's nowhere to stand on Jupiter. On the right, you'll see a, a, basically a, a map of Jupiter, what we think the inside looks like. There's an atmosphere of clouds that's regular hydrogen and helium. Then we've got liquid hydrogen and helium. And then you see the word liquid ices. Now ices, when we think about ice on earth, we only really think about water ice, but the intense heat and pressure of um, Jupiter's atmosphere is going to make gases become liquids in weird ways. And then underneath that, we think is a small rocky core. And when I say small core, it's likely that that core is about the size of the Earth. Now, if you're sitting there wondering, gas, how can gas be heavy? I want you to think about a pillow. If we were to take one pillow and set it on the ground, that's not too heavy. But if we would pile a thousand pillows on top of each other, the pillows at the bottom are going to be really smooshed together. They're going to be really, really crunched. And that is how something heavy, that's what I want you to think about when it comes to gas. That's how something that even though it's light, it actually can be super dense and make you and have a tremendous weight. One grain of rice is not heavy, but 50 pounds of rice is. So I want you to think about when you're thinking about gas. Now you'll notice underneath the picture of Jupiter, which is on the top, is Saturn. Saturn has a really similar breakdown in terms of air, uh, atmosphere versus liquid helium, but you'll notice that the ratios aren't the same. That's because Saturn is a smaller planet, which leads us to a question to talk about Saturn. Now, while we're doing that, would someone just fall through a gas planet? Excellent question. No, you would be immediately smushed and died if you tried to sail through a gas planet. Because like I said with the pillows, while gas is light, all of that gas together actually would crush you and your spaceship. And that's something that recently happened on Saturn. There was a probe, Saturn actually is staying with me. There was a probe called Cassini that was orbiting Saturn. And um, this probe was made on Earth. Now, some of the moons of Saturn, Titan, for example, um, it's a possibility that there could be life there or maybe the building blocks of life. Now, we didn't want it to risk any sort of contamination if Cassini would have crashed onto Titan. So they crashed Cassini into Saturn, knowing that as it went through the atmosphere of Saturn, it would be crushed to pieces and incinerated. So gas planets, this is where your mind has to like stretch your mind for a moment. Just because the planet's made of gas, it's still super duper heavy. Now, one question that Julie texted that um, is a really great question is why are planets spheres? And that is because of gravity. Like 90% of the questions in astronomy that I get asked by kids can be answered by gravity. Gravity has the preferred state of pulling things inward. So that's gravity's job. Gravity pulls down. Now, if you have a material, enough material, when everything is pulling inward, you get a ball. I want you to think about taking a, a piece of maybe aluminum foil and crinkling it up. As you crinkle it up, it's always going to form a ball. Think about how hard it is to form a square out of aluminum foil. And that's just not even due to gravity, just forces in general. Um, and actually being round is one of the criteria to be a planet, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, Saturn has rings. Saturn is not the only ringed planet, but the rings of Saturn are made up of small rocks and ice and grains of sand. And those are really reflective. So as the light from the sun hits the rings of Saturn, they glow, they sparkle, which causes Saturn to look like it has ears. It's a ring that we can see going there. The different bands on Jupiter and Saturn are made of different gases spinning in different directions. Now, when we look at the Earth, 
one of the things that we don't often think about the earth is how the winds travel. Now, for me, I live in Hawaii, and I don't know if you can hear the wind, but it's a fairly windy day. As because I'm closer to the equator, so I have winds called the trade winds that blow in different directions on the Earth's atmosphere. So if you're ever really you're really bored, Google wind patterns of the Earth, and this will explain all of that. Now, the reason that we see these bands on Jupiter and Saturn has to do with the way that the winds are blowing, but also the composition of those gases. And are those gases rising or falling? That's a very sophisticated question. Jupiter, uh, Saturn has its rings because Saturn has an immense gravity, as do all of the planets in the outer solar system. Jupiter has rings too, but they're just not as sparkly. As moons got too close, Saturn has um, like, 67 moons. I'll be honest, I don't always keep track because they're really frequently discovering new moons of the outer solar system. As those moons got closer and closer, they the gravity of Saturn crunched them up like a cracker. So if you could take a cracker in your hand and crunch it up, and then gravity caused those little crunched up moon bits to start orbiting Saturn. Okay, I'm going to hold off on why are planets different sizes. That's again, a very complex question that I'll get to in a minute. Our next planet is Uranus. So Uranus is my favorite planet. It is actually blue. And in this picture of Uranus, I want you to notice that its ring goes in a different direction than Saturn. That's because Uranus is a tipped over planet. When Uranus was in the process of being formed, it got tipped over. So the ring of Uranus actually goes around the equator. And the North Pole of Uranus is where you would see the smiley face on that stuffed planet there. How it got tipped over is a question that astronomers are trying to figure out. It could have been impacted by an object or two. Also, when the planets were forming, Jupiter and Jupiter's gravity really dominated what happened on all of the planets in the solar system. And at some point, astronomers hypothesize, they make an educated guess, that Jupiter's gravity caused Uranus and Neptune to be pushed back to their current positions. And this is one of the reasons why planets are different sizes. Now, we have the, the rocky planets in the closer to the solar system and the inner solar system. And then we have these big gas giant planets farther out. The reason that the gas giants planets formed and they're bigger, even though they're farther away from the sun, has a lot to do with the temperature. Um, and so in the center of the solar system, closer to where the sun is, where the Earth is, it was simply too hot to be able to get liquid, um, to have helium or hydrogen form in the vast amounts that we would have seen in the older, in the outer solar system. So when gases are forming, if they have too much gas, if they have too much heat, they have a lot of energy and it makes it really hard for them to be captured. The larger planets out further in the solar system, they were right in a great spot it's called the frost line in our solar system that allowed them to collect and collect more material through gravity and get bigger and bigger. Now, one of the big questions in astronomy right now, when we look for planets in other solar systems and other star systems, we see Jupiter sized planets at the distance from their star of Mercury. So one of the questions that astronomers are really trying to figure out is, how does that happen? With everything that we know and we see with our solar system, at what point did those planets start moving inward or outward? So Uranus is actually my favorite planet. It is blue, and it's blue because of methane in the atmosphere, in the air of Uranus. When we think about the planets, we often think little planets, big planets terrestrial planets, Jovian planets. There's actually, I would say, probably a third category. Um, one of that would be that we've got the small and rocky planets. We've got Jupiter and Saturn, which are so big that they're um, actually a little bit different from Neptune and Uranus, which are the medium-sized planets. Now, over on the right is one of my favorite pictures of Uranus. This picture is a Hubble Space Telescope picture. It's not the flashiest picture of Uranus, but what it allows you to see is really brightly the rings of Uranus. Now, this picture is not taken in optical light, light that our eyes can see. This is an ultraviolet picture, which shows that the rings of Uranus actually glow really brightly in a color of light that we're not able to see. Now, um, Uranus was the first planet that was discovered 
by people. So all of the planets up to this point, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are naked eye objects, planets that you can see with your eyeballs. Uranus was discovered in 1781 by an astronomer named William Herschel and his sister Carolyn. And so when the planet was discovered, William Herschel was the royal astronomer of England. And so his boss was the king of England. He wanted to name Uranus after his boss, King George III. So he wanted to name it King George III. No one else really went for that in the world. And so it was named Uranus after um, the, in Roman mythology, Jupiter was the king of the gods, Saturn was his father, Uranus was his grandfather. And we notice now, if we start to take a look at the period, one year on Uranus is 84 Earth years. So if anybody has any grandparents or great grandparents that are 84 on Jupiter, they would, I mean, on Uranus, they would be one. Now our next planet is Neptune. Neptune's actually hanging out with me as well. Oftentimes people ask me, why does Neptune have a black eye? It doesn't. When I, we talked about Jupiter, I forgot to mention the Great Red Spot, which is a huge hurricane that's been raging on Jupiter as long as we've been able to look at it. That Great Red Spot is roughly the size of the Earth. On Neptune, this is a hurricane as well. This is the Great Dark Spot. Um, and on the Earth, hurricanes break up when they go over land. Because there's no land on any of these outer planets, these storms can rage for really, really, really long periods of time. Now, if we look on, at the image on the left here, which is sort of that map of Neptune, we see that Neptune's made out of a slightly different things than Jupiter and Saturn. So when we're talking about what the composition of Neptune would be like, we're also talking about Uranus too. So we see we've got all of this liquid hydrogen and helium, then we have highly compressed liquid water and ammonia. And I like to think of that a little bit like windshield wiper fluid. Now there was a question, does it rain diamonds on Uranus and Neptune? The answer is probably. On the earth, we have that water cycle where carbon goes down, uh, where water falls down as rain and then goes back into the Earth's atmosphere. This ammonia and methane on Neptune has very similar in that there would be a ton of carbon in it and that carbon would rain down and carbon under an intense heat and pressure forms diamonds. So I see Julie back. Do I have a chance to talk about Pluto real quick, Julie? Yeah, you can, can take a few minutes uh, to talk about Pluto. I think we're going to come back to Pluto in more details in another talk, but All okay, right, two more minutes. Two more All minutes. Right. Two more minutes. Okay, so this is Pluto and its moon, Sharon. They're sitting on my porch. So we didn't get our first good look at Pluto until 2015. Now, when we talk about what's a planet, we didn't really have a definition of a planet until Pluto, the Pluto problem arose. So in 2003, there was an astronomer who used one of the telescopes here in Hawaii who discovered an object called Eris, and you can see my pictures here, Eris is bigger than Pluto. So astronomers were then kind of in a pickle. Should Eris be a planet or should we create another category? Now, a lot of people feel sad for Pluto. Pluto is a bunch of frozen rock and gas. It has no feelings. But what this teaches us is astronomy and science in action. When we learn about the planets, when we learn about a lot of things in science, as kids, you don't often think that science changes. But Pluto teaches us that it does. So to be a planet, you got to be three things. You have to be round, which means you have enough gravity to have formed into a sphere. You have to orbit the sun. So the moon will never be a planet because it orbits the earth. And when you go on your path, when you orbit the sun, you have to be the biggest planet on the block. And Pluto actually crosses Neptune's orbit, which is why Pluto is not a planet. Now I'm not going to go into too much more detail because there are better people. So here are all of my planets. Here's everybody I work with. And this is where you can learn more and ask questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. We had tons of questions coming. We didn't get to answer all of them, but you know what? We still have weeks to go, I believe. So we'll come back. <laughs> we'll get you again to answer more questions. I did get a question quite a few times and I was wondering if you were willing to share 
Absolutely. Where do you get those plush toys? <laughs> so there is a uh, company called Celestial Buddies. I have one of all of them, Celestial Buddies, and you can buy the stuffed planets from them. Um, I actually bought mine from a local science center to share that profits. Uh, but Celestial Buddies is great. They're on Facebook and Twitter. I tweet to Celestial Buddies all of the time. So I'll give them a solid shout out here, Celestial Buddies. Awesome. Thank you so much for Mary, Mary Beth. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Beth. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us uh, with all your great questions. And we'll get Mary Beth again to come and talk to you about other things in the next few weeks, if you're okay with that. Oh, I'm totally am. And so I just want to do a quick plug. This is very different from what Julie's doing. So if you can't get enough astronomy content, Mauna Kea Observatory is at home. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. We'll leave it there. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. we'll have another session, another topic, and then we'll have more like this in the next few weeks. Thanks a lot, Mary Beth, and enjoy your day in Hawaii. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day there. I just want to say, can I say a quick hi if you're watching Brooke and Grant in Pittsburgh, Marley and Wesley in Boston. Hi. <laughs> Bye.